Hello everyone. Today I'd like to offer a few thoughts on how to make progress in life. By this I mean the sort of progress that brings inner peace, expansion of consciousness and the depth of wisdom that throws light on the meaning of life. We may think of progress as something which shows itself outwardly and can be seen and admired by others. But there is also a more profound kind of progress that we may have overlooked and which is available to everyone regardless of our situation in life. And that is progress to enlightenment through self-knowledge. All progress has small beginnings, but even a little familiarity with these teachings can bring relief and reassurance that our life is worthwhile and full of potentiality. In fact, we can go so far as to say that any progress we make in our life in the world is only truly valuable if it is accompanied by something more. What is that? It is a flowering of internal peace and the knowledge that our true self is something far greater than the body and the mind we normally think ourselves to be. It's also the case that our mind has a boundless appetite for wanting more than it has and for becoming bored and restless with the here and now. And this restlessness puts a question mark over the ultimate value of the outer progress. Then what can we do to avoid this recurrent unrest? we need to ask ourselves what is it that my mind really wants? What is it searching for in all the experiences that make up our life? So the focus is on the mind and we need to realize that our mind has a much greater range, power and depth than is normally appreciated. At all times, our mind is an amazing storehouse of partially known powers and as yet unknown potentialities. These unknown potentialities have the greatest relevance to our happiness, security and freedom. So how do we get the best out of our mind? How? It is through evolution and enlightenment. First we evolve by means of education. At the same time we can, if we like, pursue a further development. This development involves the refinement of the mind and its transformation into the peace and light of the higher wisdom. This is the progress that leads to enlightenment. Our self-training is not the case of acquiring qualities that we now lack, no. The peak of wisdom is the realization of the perfection and universality of our true self. This knowledge is already present within us, though unrecognized. On this path to enlightenment, we are also encouraged to cultivate qualities like peace of mind and fellow feeling. 
These two are not really new tendencies. We have them already. The source of all great qualities is our true self. But in most people, these qualities need to be strengthened, deepened and universalized. In this way, we are aligning our mind, that is to say, harmonizing our thoughts and feelings with the universal and all-embracing nature of our higher self. And these inner adjustments to the way we think will allow our higher self to manifest in our experience. So all the great qualities in the higher wisdom are already within us, but their greatness needs to be fully brewed out. This expansion and deepening also applies to the emotion of love. Love, in various forms, is an intrinsic part of human nature. What is at the root of this need for love? It is intrinsically a yearning for infinite and immortal delight and beauty. But this yearning can only be satisfied when our emotions are transmuted into the higher love. Therefore, the path of love or Bhakti Yoga is a well-recognized path to enlightenment. This particular path builds on tendencies which are very much operative in our life, namely personal affection and the power of concentration. Under traditional guidance, we may, if we wish, learn how this great love energy can be eased out of its narrowness and transformed into an aid to liberation. Of course, the word love has many levels of meaning. Some may feel that love is mostly a matter of physical attraction and appetite. Friends, this is a very limited view. Anyone who has really loved will know that love in order to flourish, weeds out selfishness. It demands a steady strength of mind and heart that is rarely found in other departments of life. As Shakespeare said, Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Such true love does not alter with time and is never withdrawn whatever happens. Shakespeare was talking about human love, but human love of a high order. And such love has the eyes to see and respect something deeper in a person and to feel an inner unity with them. This quality of love is not swayed or dislodged by the occasional distresses and disturbances that visit our mind. And in terms of the yogic psychology, such love is rooted in the deeper and wiser part of our mind called the buddhi and is not influenced or distracted by fickle likes and dislikes. So this steady human love 
already has much wisdom running through it. It goes beyond appearances. It dissolves the selfish egoism of the lover. And this in itself produces a great expansion of consciousness. Let us now pause briefly and do a short meditation on a text which affirms the cosmic aspect of this great force of love that we all carry in our heart. And the text we're going to meditate on is this. Om. I am one with the infinite power of love. I am peace. I am light. Om. Um. In our meditation, we affirmed our oneness with the infinite power of love. Is this just a fantasy? Or can such love really be expanded infinitely? Yes. There is a way of expansion. It is through love of the transcendent element in our own being. This transcendent principle is our true substance, the life of our life. Its quality is unique and superior to anything we may have we may unearth in the fields of outer progress. We're talking about our innermost self, our essence. And this is that dimension of our nature which is not confined within the coverings of the body and the mind. Ultimately, this self is to be realized as universal undying, infinite. This is the true secret behind our unending quest for happiness. For the source of bliss is this deeper reality within us. And until we realize this infinite bliss within, we shall continue to feel incomplete. Will this hidden quality of our true self simply emerge by itself in life as we go on? No. The inner transformation takes place when we have learned to look upon our own mind with a degree of objectivity and to take charge of its expression and direction. For concealed within the depths of our inner life is the power of higher intuition that we referred to earlier called the Buddhi. This can only be brought out by careful and persistent application. Hence we are encouraged to develop an awareness of our mental powers. Our ultimate aim is to transform the energy of thought and feeling into profound peace 
and universal love, lit by the light of a higher understanding. Now let us ask, which of our mental powers is crucial for this inner development? It is our memory and the use we make of it. What we hold in our memory colors the whole of the mind and often determines our cheap or misery. So let us use our memory consciously to bring to mind great teachings, ideas that open a way. And through using our memory in this way, we create an opening in the depths of our being. That inner opening will reveal the limitless light of the true self. What are these great teachings we should impress on our memory? These are teachings that have a pure source and an infinite depth. There may be something we have read in a recognized scripture, some episode that claims our particular interest and which yields deeper meaning the more it is pondered. We may choose as our focus part of a sermon or discourse that we feel is especially meaningful. Or we may prefer an eclectic approach, giving our attention to sayings and stories that relate to a particular theme. And as an example of this latter form of memory feeding, we may be drawn to teachings that relate to the present moment, the eternal now. If so, we will be open to the wisdom of many traditions. In the Masnavi of Rumi, we find, for example, thought is of the past and future when it is emancipated from these two, the difficulty is solved. I'll say that again. Thought is of the past and future. When it is emancipated from these two, the difficulty is solved. In a text from the Zen tradition, there is the verse This moment's thought sees through eternal time. Eternal time is just this moment. If you see through this moment's thought, you see through the one who sees through the moment. Let us now pause and let us do a breathing practice together related to this very theme, the reality and immediacy of the present moment. Breathe a little more deeply than usual and as you breathe in, say to yourself the word here. And as you breathe out the word now. In this way, you can stop your mind from getting lost in thoughts of the past or the future. We gain a new sense of the living reality, the essential freedom of the here, now. Freedom because the here and now itself transcends those very thoughts of past and future. 
So the practice is, as you breathe in, say to yourself the word here. And as you breathe out the word now. And we will do this together for a minute or two. This theme of the reality and immediacy of the present moment is an example of the kind of material worth adding to our memory. There are many themes that can be used in this way, such as the one in the many, the nature of I am, the benefit of stilling the mind, and so on. Such subjects are inexhaustible in their depths of meaning and shed light on the depths of our own higher being. Needless to say, we can also soak our mind in the universal teachings of the higher yoga. Here, you find a treasury of illuminating insights and direct teachings on the nature of the self. This, for example, is a text that tells us that self is a limitless light of consciousness that animates our mind and makes all experience possible. Om. I am the inner light which prompts the mind. I am the sun which lights the whole universe. When an idea like this enters our inner being, it becomes available to our memory. It becomes part of us. The more we make use of it, the more it will become an extension of our own consciousness. When our mind is nourished in this way, new and helpful thoughts will spring up spontaneously and serve as a guiding light in our life. So let us pause and reflect for a minute or two on this meditation text. I am the inner light which prompts the mind. I am the sun which lights the whole universe. If you have a compass, perhaps you are on a mountain or in some remote region, 
and there is a disturbance, the compass needle may jump and wobble for a few seconds. Then it will settle back to its natural position, pointing to the direction of the magnetic north. In a similar way, our mind may undergo temporary disturbances and upsets. If we have knowledge of this teaching about the true self, we will find that our consciousness can quickly return to a peaceful stability. Our mind can reach a point where it naturally seeks to commune with the infinite as its real home and support. And for those who follow this path, something transcendent and universal has now entered the thought stream from the depth of our own being. This awakened inner force has the power to overcome and replace thoughts and connect us with the inner peace. It is an entry into a stream of life that will eventually reveal itself as identical with the infinite ocean of truth universal. Well friends, we have talked a little about making inner progress through love. We pointed out how our memory can help us if we fill it with the right material. Let's now explain briefly what we mean by knowledge in this context and how a certain type of knowledge can aid our progress to illumination. The position as regards the supreme self-knowledge is unique. For in a sense, we are trying to know something that we already know at the deepest level of our being. Yes, everyone is already the self. And so the knowledge of our own true nature is already established. It doesn't need any help at all from our mind or intellect. But for reasons that are beyond the power of our intellect to grasp, a kind of conditioning has set in. This conditioning makes us unaware of the true nature of the infinite reality. And this condition of unawareness, we have convinced ourselves that what is real is our state of individuality and the world we see around us and have to deal with. This sense of limitation has overcome us so that we see and feel limitations and restrictions everywhere. And when we are challenged by difficulties, we feel trapped in identification with a finite body and mind. Our whole life has become grounded in the assumption that self is body and mind and the world is a firm, inescapable reality. Now the non-dual teachings gradually undermine this position and show us there is a deeper and more liberating way of viewing life and its purpose. First, we are told that our identity is not totally invested in body and mind. We are taught to view our body and our mind as if they are coverings of something much greater, deeper and freer. And that, as we have heard, is our innermost self. 
another teaching that can help us transcend limitations is to look on our body and mind as instruments of this higher inner principle, our true self. This idea comes in the Bhagavad Gita when Krishna tells Arjuna, do thou act as a mere instrument, that is, with your body and mind moving and acting in service of the higher inner power. From another standpoint, the whole purpose of being endowed with a body and mind is to enable us to realize our identification with the infinite power at our source. This power is first discerned as the power behind the mind and is then realized to be universal and all-pervading. That widening and deepening of our love energy that we talked of earlier is a kind of preparation. It prepares our mind for the realization of the deeper self-knowledge of the self as it is in freedom and transcendence. For true love shifts our psychological center of gravity from the mind to the living power that underlies it. But the final aim of devotion is the recognition that this ultimate principle is nothing other than our true self. And this recognition is called the higher knowledge. It is not a visitor to our mind or a grace from some outer source, but is the very substratum of our being. The ultimate use of memory is to remember that dimension of our being which is ever achieved. This is our I as it really is, without the overlay of mental ideas and the confusions and complications they introduce. Being the true I, it is that which is always nearest to us, in the sense that it is our immediate consciousness and being. But when other things absorb our attention, our true nature is forgotten and what really matters seems to be our contact with sense objects and worldly affairs. We cannot hope to remember the ever achieved, to realize the true self while our mind is a whirl without the incidents and driven by desires, cares, fears and hopes. But something can be done to restore us to the inner peace and light, to bring us back to our true self, so to say. And this is the purpose of daily meditation. In meditation, we affirm our independence of outer things and make the mind calm and relatively still. We forget our illusory personality and affirm our transcendent nature, the real I hidden behind the veils of thought. It is in inner stillness that knowledge of the true self is uncovered and shines in its full glory. This stillness is always with us, 
in us and around us. And through our own stillness, it is possible to sense that great ocean of stillness in which we live and move. One short practice on this theme is to pause occasionally, sit still and quiet and say to yourself, I sit in the direct light and stillness of pure being. So let us do this for a minute or two. Um. Oh. We live in the light of the deeper reality, which is all in all. But our extrovertive mental activity and preoccupation with the world of multiplicity prevent us from realizing this dimension of experience. Becoming a true lover and a true knower means being willing to forget our sense of separation from the Beloved and also to forget our individuality. This need for progress on the path until the ever-achieved goal is realized is illustrated by a story from the Masnavi. And Rumi, tale, Rumi tells how a certain man having been allowed to sit with his beloved, produced a love letter. Ignoring her presence, he insisted on reading the letter, which told of his praises, his humble services, his lover's pain, and his great wish to be with the beloved. She said, I'm here beside you, and you're reading a letter? If this is for my sake, to read this at the time of our meeting is to waste one's life. This is not the mark of true lovers. In the same way, the desire for liberation is the urge to progress to the very goal of the higher yoga and not stay fixed in any passing psychological condition, however agreeable. True knowledge is to recognize that the beloved is present here, now, as one's immediate consciousness and being, and that the bliss, love and knowledge we thirst for have their eternal source within ourselves. The recognition of this truth takes place in inner silence. The pen that goes on writing the love letter of you and I must in the end be laid aside. Then the force of our attention and sensitivity is turned to one spot alone, set at the very center of our being. It is denoted by the word I. We then realize with certainty that we are what we seek and the only distance between ourself and the all-pervading reality is the one created by our own thoughts.
thank you for your attention.